Yes, I never get tired of surf rock. So welcome to episode six already of Meriwether's World, uh, where something happens. <laughs> okay, I didn't have a little quip this time. So tonight's episode is going to be about medicinal landscaping, uh, particularly talking about trees. Tonight's sponsor is Uncommon Bees. They are the people whose honey I use when I make my medicines. So they are really awesome. Uh, I've spent a great deal of time on their property where they have their hives just identifying plants and helping them figure out what plants are there, and which I guess is the same as identifying plants, but trying to increase the plant diversity there. So Uncommon Bees is tonight's sponsor. A uh, quick note, we have a number of classes. We, I, I have a number of classes coming up uh, that still have some slots open. So this weekend and next weekend, if you go to the Foraging Texas website, www.foragingtexas.com, under the upcoming classes, uh, you can see uh, this weekend, this Saturday, there will be one in Spring, Texas. And then the following Saturday, it will be in Montgomery, Texas. As usual, I am joined tonight with Minnie Weather. She'll be running the keyboard and typing things in and all that. So uh, hopefully we have things going on here. Hey, we got some people already. Cool. So we got Nick. We got Carrie. Hello, Carrie, the goat lady. And by goat lady, I mean a lady who owns goats, not like she's a goat. Anyway, let's continue. Oh, one last thing in case you haven't guessed. The other thing going on tonight will be a lovely Pinot Grigori. I don't know. I, I just drink this stuff. If you were here last week, you heard me talk about Scout and Cellar, uh, the maker of clean wines, or the acquirer, acquirer -er 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 of clean wines. That means wines with no extra sugar, or any of the 218 approved chemicals from the FDA. It's fruit and yeast and water and love. Um, but really, Uncommon Bees is where it's at tonight. So, But just like slugging honey, not the best thing to do. Okay, uh, what else do I have going on? Oh, so... Yeah, we talked about the classes. We talked about what we're talking about tonight. So let us continue. And then um, while I'm talking about the medicinal landscaping trees, uh, I will be focused on the particular plant I'm talking about at the time. So if you have a question about some totally random different tree than what I'm talking about or have not yet talked about, um, just hold on to it and you know, closer to the end, we'll get to that. Uh, my goal is to have most of the time filled with the presentation, but then plenty of time for a Q&A afterwards, just because there's a lot of questions out there, I'm sure. Okay, so without further ado, yard medicine, landscaping with healing plants. Now, originally I was planning on covering, you know, all the healing plants in one episode, and hence the title Healing Plants. But after I finished the trees, I realized that alone is enough for one night. So, whoa, almost knocked my wine over. Um, so, yeah. How this is going to work, uh, first I'll just give you a couple of cautions about herbal medicine. I know you think it's natural, it's safe, it's wonderful, it's fine, it's all good and lovely. And in truth, that's not always the case. So there are a couple of things you need to keep in mind with that. And then we'll talk about the different ways of preparing the herbal medicines because you know, knowing how to use it is just as useful as knowing what to use. And then we'll go into the plants. And by plants, this time I mean trees. Okay, so cautions. Three big things. And they simply boil down to nature doesn't mean risk-free. You know, people talk about all natural being completely safe to you. And I keep thinking... Cobra venom is all natural. Black, wider, black widow spider venom is all natural. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's risk-free. There are still toxins. There's a famous saying in medicine that the difference often between poison and medicine is dosage. So, you know, it's as easy to overdose on a plant medicine as it is to overdose on a commercial manufactured pharmaceutical medicine. Second, nature does not mean a magic cure. 
Uh, the internet is filled with all sorts of claims and posts and stuff that, you know, this will cure that. And it, it's, you know, hidden by the pharmaceutical companies because they need their money, blah, blah, blah. In the end, being a Western scientist and I look at the scientific facts behind things, um, I'll tell you right now, there are no magic cures. They still may be um, as effective or just slightly less effective than the pharmaceutical, sometimes even more. But if you are dying of cancer, please continue the chemotherapy rather than just turning to the turkey tail mushroom. Okay, and then the final thing you need to remember about the plant medicines and medicines made from plants is plants themselves do not have much in the way of quality control. And across a bunch of the same plants, the amount of medicinal compounds in it can vary quite a bit from plant to plant. It depends on growing conditions and sunlight and water and minerals and all this sort of thing. And so even plants right next to each other, because you know there's the whole genetic side too, comes into play. And so the, the concentrations can be variable from plant to plant. So you won't really know the, the true dosage level of the plant. You just kind of have to do it by trial and error. Okay, so medicinal concoctions. What are the different ways of using plants? Uh, there's quite a few. And starting with the simplest is the poultice, where you just mash up the plant and stick it against your skin. No solvents, no nothing, just mashed plant on your skin. The next is a tisane. Uh, a lot of people will use the term herbal tea, and then really hardcore herbalists get kind of bummed out by that term because to them, a tea is a drink specifically made with the sensania or the tea plant. And if it's tea made without the tea plant, then it is a tisane. But basically that just means soak it in water, water, either hot water or boiling, depending on the type of plant material. Now a tincture is you soak it in ethanol. Ethanol is the drinking alcohol. So depending on the type of plant, it could be your vodka type. Or can he reach it? This is like, oh, that's vodka too. Mini weather, can you hand me? Well, Everclear, yes. So, the Everclear type stuff. Thank you. So, but soaking the plant in ethanol is a tincture. Now, an elixir is when you start mixing honey into the tincture. Usually, it's a 50 50 mix of ethanol and honey, and then another you know plant in there. So, Really, it's like 33.333% plant, 33.3333% alcohol, and 33.3333% honey. Uh, but the end result is to stay sweeter, easier to get down, doesn't make your eyes kind of go like Everclear does. All right, the Oxymel, that is a mixture of honey and vinegar, uh, usually apple cider vinegar. Uh, the class this weekend in the, the medicinal class will be making a fire cider which is probably one of the most famous of the oxymels that are it's out there right now. But it's simply uh, honey and ethanol. The syrup, that is when you basically make a tisane, add a bunch of sugar, and boil it into a syrup. Again, this is a very kid-friendly as far as getting them to take the medicine. Um, but as, oh, and also syrups, because of the high sugar content, will be somewhat uh, shelf-stable not as stable as the tinctures and the elixirs and the oxmels, but still better than just a tisane. Okay, a liniment is when you use a non-consumable alcohol. Usually it's isopropanol, the rubbing alcohol, to make a tincture. Um, and it is used externally only, you know, rubbing on arthritic joints, let's say, things like that, or in my case, bone pain. An oil infusion is where you soak the plants in some form of vegetable or nut oil. Uh, or if you have access to it, bear grease, but most people don't have access to bear grease. Uh, but an oil infusion, you infuse the medicinal compounds from the plants into the oil. And then a salve is just an ointment uh, made with the oil infusion, but adding beeswax to harden it up some. 
So these are the different ways that you would then use the following plants. And as we go through uh, the presentation, the plants will, or the, in this case, the trees will have listed, you know, do you use it as a tisane, a tincture, or an ox mouth, and you know, what type, and even what parts of the plant. So I'm trying to give you a good starting basis for this sort of thing. So at this point, since we probably have time for things to catch up, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, Miss Gracie wants to clarify the difference between vodka and Everclear, and then ask why would we choose one over the other? Great question. Okay, so the difference between Everclear and vodka is concentration of the ethanol. Vodka is usually up to 50% ethanol and 50% water, which you know, gives it what they call 100 proof. But it's 50% ethanol, 50% water. Whereas Everclear is, uh, was it 90? Yeah, it's 90% ethanol and 10% water. So Everclear is significantly higher concentration. So it has a lot more of the ethanol, a lot less water than the vodka. Now, where do you use them? Great question. If you, uh, well, if you've heard me talk, you heard me talk about how plants have a cell wall and all the compounds you want are inside that cell wall. And if you just put the green plant, say, in vodka, the nothing happens because all the compounds just stay inside the cell wall. They you know they can't get out so you just have a lot of pretty leaves in vodka and no infusion is going on but if you take those green leaves fresh off the plant and put them in everclear with its uh 190 proof or you know our, sorry uh yeah 180 190 proof 90 percent ethanol at that concentration of ethanol the water in the cells uh, basically wants to join with the ethanol to dilute it down, and so the cells rupture. So if you are making medicine from green, fresh plants, generally you put them in the Everclear, the highly concentrated alcohol. Now, if you are making a tincture from a dried plant, because remember, if you let the plants dry, there's an enzyme that opens up and puts holes through the cell walls. So then when you put the dried leaves at least two weeks dried two weeks into the vodka then the cell walls have holes the vodka can go in the stuff can come out and so you can uh, basically make your diffusion or your your infusion sorry uh with dried plants so dried plants use vodka fresh green plants use everclear uh, one other side thing for using the Everclear. So not only is the strength of ethanol enough to start rupturing the cell walls, but remember, plants are more than 50% water. There's a lot of water in a fresh green plant. And so that water is going to mix with the the uh, Everclear and dilute it down almost to about the level of vodka. So you need at least 40% ethanol in your tincture for them to be shelf stable. So the Everclear and the vodka both give you plenty of, of spare space if you want to like dilute it some or mix it with other things. Um, but yeah, long story short, Everclear for green, fresh, vodka for dried. Any other questions? Do you ever use brandy or whiskey? Brandy. I use brandy in elixirs. Uh, traditionally, when you are mixing the ethanol with honey, uh, a lot of the old medicinal herbal books and so forth recommend using brandy. I feel part of that is because brandy just tastes better with uh, extra sweetness or some of the other uh, alcohols get a little weird, in my opinion, um, and apparently the opinion of the older herbalists, too. Um, as far as whiskey, no, that's just uh, use that for sipping. Occasionally, I will use gin. Uh, just to give a more complex flavor. Uh, but if I'm just doing strictly for medicinal property, properties, it's going to be the vodka or the Everclear. Anything else? All right. And then how long is too long when it comes to drying plants? Good question. How long is too long with drying plants? Um, that's, that's a good question. It kind of depends on the plant. So for general, your average soft leaf, at least two weeks, uh, one of the things that happens over that time is so you get the, the holes in the cell wall. So the moisture can escape. 
Once the moisture has escaped, then you basically have plant jerky. It's dehydrated. And so it's pretty stable, especially if you either vacuum pack it or put it in a jar. But really a dried plant, traditionally it is kept until the next year's harvest. So really uh, the dried plants, there are very few that I won't throw out. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any that I would throw out before the next year's plants are ready to harvest. Now, the heavier duty the leaf, the thicker the leaf or the root uh, material, that can take longer to dry. If you are using curled dock root, which is this big carrot-like root, uh, they recommend drying that you know, one to two years before you even do anything with it. And then iris roots, the uh, blue iris or the Louisiana iris, that becomes very, very medicinal after it's aged two to five years. But in general, one year. Okay, any other questions? Yep, there's one more. What kind of oil should be used for an oil infusion? What sort of oil? Good question. Where is my... Okay, so I cover that in my little Common Missile Plants book. But there's a couple of different oils, and I'm going to see if you can kind of see it here. Okay, so olive oil is an excellent moisturizer, uh, rich in antioxidants and relatively cheap. Sunflower oil is an excellent moisturizer. It's a bit thinner, so it's more quickly absorbed. And then grapeseed oil is really good for rehydrating skins and removing wrinkles. And the saf uh, safflower oil is very rich in uh, oleic acids and uh, vitamin E. So, oh, and then if you notice the cocoa butter, it says causes drying of skin and is not recommended. So when I am making a infused oil, part of the issue is what is it going to be used for? Uh, like my cayenne pepper uh, salve, where I'm rubbing it into sore joints and sore ribs and things like that. I use the sunflower oil because it absorbs more quickly and delivers uh, the compounds to the, the joint or the ribs much more quickly. If it's more of a just a skin sort of irritation, like a dried skin or callousy skin or things like that, then I'm going to use olive oil. Uh, if I want it to be really shelf stable for a long time, say something I just keep in my desk at work, then I'll use the uh, safflower oil just because it has the so much uh, the vitamin E in it that it's very shelf stable. So... I mean, that's a, just a quick thing. I recommend going back and re-watching re the video. But the, the main thing is don't use the cocoa butter and the cocoa oil. They're, they're actually drying. They have a tendency to pull the oils out of the skin rather than going into the skin themselves. Okay, let us continue on. And then uh, we'll get back to some more questions. But again, first, a word from our sponsor. I'm not doing the little funny video where they say word anymore. That just wasn't working. But I mentioned the Uncommon Bees is tonight's sponsor. You can find them at a bunch of the Houston uh, different farmers markets and so forth. Follow them on Facebook. Follow them on Instagram. They have a whole line of just plain honey as well, infused honey and different beeswax products all made uh, using the bees in their apiary here. Uh, most of it is actually out towards the Jasper, but they do have some local uh, hives too. But just really, really amazing people. And I love them a lot. They've been friends of mine for a while, man, several years, uh, and just bend over backwards for me and really everyone else. Frankly, they're a little too nice. Don't take advantage of them. Okay, so... Trees, medicinal trees. It's 15 minutes in and you're finally going to get into it. So let's start with the bottle brush tree. Now the bottle brush tree is not native. It is originally from Australia, I believe. Um, and it is, the, I'm not even gonna try and say this, the scientific name, you can see it there. But there are several species and this includes both the bottle brush trees and the bottle brush shrubs with their very unique bottle brushy sort of leaves. Now, what do you do with this tree? So the bottle brush leaf and flower is made into a tisane or a, a, a tea. So it's just soaked in water. Um, with the flowers, you want to use just hot water. 
with the leaves because the leaves are a bit harder. Um, if, uh, well, even then the leaves, you really want to just uh, put in hot water. But why do you want this? Well, the bottle brush tree actually has a number of useful medicinal purposes. Uh, the first, it's antifungal. So as a body wash, you know, the armpits, the jock itch, athlete's foot, things like that, it's a really good way of dealing with a fungal infection, soaking your feet in a tisane made out of the bottle brush flower or leaf uh, can help with the athlete's foot and even toenail fungus if you can get it under there. It's also antibacterial, so it's good for minor infections both inside you and surface. So you, if you're you know, having some food poisoning and you need to kill that bacteria in you, if you have a bottle brush tree out there, uh, you can you know, hopefully get the flowers or have stored the leaves for at least two weeks to have a, a antibacterial drink ready. It's absolutely loaded with antioxidants and antioxidants. One of the big things about them is a strong evidence that uh, by scavenging the free radicals in your body, you reduce the chance of cancer. So the bottle brush itself, the tree has not been tested for specific anti-cancer type properties as some of the future trees that we'll talk about are, but just the fact that it is a strong antioxidant in itself, a, a tisane from this will help, you know, like I said, wipe out the free radicals in your body that are one of the biggest causes of damage to the DNA. And then finally, it's a pretty good cough suppressant. Unlike the uh, laurel cherry, which actually paralyzes your throat, it more just kind of soothes and coats and reduces the irritation that causes coughing. And the coughing that does happen, it's a little more produ productive. The phlegm is a bit more loosened and comes out. So bottle brush tree, tea made from the flowers and leaves, Antifungal, antibacterial, antioxidant, and a cough suppressant can be used interior or exterior. So internal or external. Okay, the catalpa tree. I see a lot of these landscaping. I get asked about these beans a lot from the catalpa. The catalpa beans are not edible. Um, the edible part, well, sorry, the medicinal part though, are the beans and the bark of the tree. So the outer bark scraped from a branch, ideally you don't want to take the bark from the trunk. Usually the trunk bark is actually too thick and hard to break down. Plus it's too close to the core of the tree. And so a fungal infection in the trunk can more rapidly sped, spread throughout the tree. So you want to take the bark from branches, like where you cut the branch off and strip the bark. Now the tea from this is even better than the bottle brush tree as far as just general respiratory soothing and cough suppressing. So a tea drank when you're you know, just hacking up a lung or your, your bronchitis or things like that, uh, not asthma, but the other just racking coughs from sicknesses, from colds and flus, it's very soothing for that. Um, external, uh, I don't know why you would put it externally. I think that was a leftover from when I was copying and pasting. So a tea made from the catalpa drank is really good for respiratory issues, especially respiratory is, uh, irritations. Like I said, in the case of asthma, use your inhaler, get to the hospital, but your basic racking coughs from different colds and flus, the catalpa actually is a pretty soothing medicine for that. Okay, just uh, any questions on those two? Uh, yep, there's a question about a bottle brush tincture. Like, can you make it? Bottle brush tincture. Yes, um, if we go back to that. I personally, oh, actually I have. Um, I have not done it medicinally, uh, but I worked with uh, the Real Brewing Company up in the Hill Country and incorporated it into a gin. Um, as far as the medicinal properties from a tincture, I have not seen any scientific proof that that works. There is no reason it shouldn't, but generally I like to have it proven to me elsewhere that you know there's actually a purpose. And there is scientific papers on the tea, on the, on the tisane uh, version of the bottle brush for medicinal properties.
There's a couple more. So green beans or dried on tree? The green beans. You use the, the fresh green beans. The dried ones, a lot of the compounds are already breaking down. Now, you want to take them green and then let them dry. Uh, in doing that, you have a better control. You have a better idea of just how old they are. If you just see brown beans hanging out on the tree, especially because it rains and so forth, humidity, there can be fungus, there can be other problems with the beans, so it's best collecting the green beans, stringing them up to dry. Is there one more question? Okay, one more question. All right. So do you use the beans like bark, or are they used differently? Use them like bark. Crush them up, the whole bean, uh, if you have like a food processor or something, after it's dried, crush it up, and then just soak it in the hot water, strain it before drinking. So you can do it with the bark or the, the beans. Uh, it's recommended when the beans are available, collect the beans because there are a lot of beans and you're less likely to damage the tree like you do when you're collecting bark. And then, like I said, once you have the beans and they've dried, air dried, you can seal them in an airtight container and keep them someplace dark and they'll be good for just about a year uh, for use. Okay, so now let's go on to the cedar, the juniper. Here in Texas, we have, in the East Texas area, we have the Virginia or red cedar. And then in the hill country, we have the Texas cedar. So the junipers, Virginia is the red cedar, the East Texas cedar. And the juniperus ashy is the Texas cedar, the hill country cedar. Luckily, you can use them both the same way. Which, whoops, and, ah, okay. So... The cedars, especially the leaf, has a lot of medicinal properties and be used in a number of different ways. So the leaves can be made into the tisane or the, the water infusion. They can be soaked in alcohol to make the tincture. You throw some honey in there, you get the elixir, or you skip all the alcohol and go straight to the vinegar, apple cider vinegar and honey to make the oxymel. Now, the main uses of this cedar, it's, again, a very soothing sort of uh, material. So not just the respiratory, like the bottle brush and the catalpa, but the gastrointestinal tract and uh, even the urinary tract. It also helps with indigestion. So if you have some bloating or you know, gas or just a general unfeeling of goodness, a uh, feeling of ungoodness, <laughs> I'd like to say it is good wine tonight. But anyway, back to the cedar. Uh, so yeah, it will just basically help soothe your interior when your interior is kind of inflamed and upset. It is a diuretic, so it will make you pee, uh, which is also good for uh, flushing out the system too. Um, I personally can't say anything about it soothing the, the painful menstruation, but there's a lot of... Uh, proof that it helps with that. And then the chronic pain of rheumatism. Uh, there's signs that the cedar can actually help with that. Uh, in that case, uh, usually you would either soak the joint in it. Uh, so make a, a, a tisane, the wash, and just kind of soak the joint in it. That's, that's feeling the pain. Uh, if you drink it in the form of the tea or the tincture or the elixir, uh, it's not quite as effective for the rheumatic pain. And then finally, it is antibacterial. So if you have a wound or some sort of infection, again, the cedar, the juniper, is really good at killing bacteria. And again, you can use it internally or externally. So this is the leaves, the berries, and the wood don't quite have the same medicinal properties. Uh, you just go with the leaves. And in the case of the cedar, I actually usually use the Everclear to make the tinctures rather than the vodka. Um, I find it's a kind of a hard plant, and even when it's dry, I don't completely trust that the cell walls are ruptured enough for the medicinal compounds to come out. But with Everclear, that's like hitting it with a hand grenade. So, so I'm gonna, oh, got a question. Yep, this one was pretty good. If you can make a tea out of something, why can't you just eat it? Okay, why can't you just eat it? Usually because it's going to taste bad. 
Um, but mainly when you're making a tea, you're kind of doing a concentrated thing and you're not getting everything out of the uh, the plant when you're making a tea. You're leaving certain uh, material behind. Um, but in a nutshell or in an emergency situation, eating it uh, may be effective, but over the years, and we're talking, you know, 10,000 years approximately of medicinal herb sort of thing. It just seems that the, the general consensus is drinking it speeds up the process. Oh, I, this is uh, what I call a swag, a scientific wild ass guess. But my swag also is this, if you have to eat the plant material, and it gets down into your stomach, a lot of it is going to pass through you undigested. Uh, whereas when you make a tea from it, the molecules are want already free of the plant material and ready to pass from the stomach wall into the bloodstream or even you know from your mouth and so forth. So I'm guessing really the reason for making a tea or tincture is very likely uh, bioavailability. It's easier for the body to get the chemicals from the tea, from the tincture, than from the plant itself just by eating the plant but again that's that's just basically a, a scientific wild ass guess but it sounds reasonable uh, i don't know if you know but i have a master's in medicinal chemistry uh, and so just drug delivery is a huge thing um, you know where will the blood be absorbed from you know being consumed you know does it go from the, the mouth and the throat and the stomach and the intestines you know at what point does it pass into the bloodstream and then how quickly is it broken down um so again that that to me lends credence to the whole the freer the medicinal compounds are the easier it is for them to get into the body so good okay um Next one, the chase tree, also known as the uh, butterfly tree, um, monk's pepper, very, very common landscaping plant. Again, it is not native to Texas, um, but it's such a beautiful and long lasting blooming tree that it's really um, used in a lot of landscaping. And it's even gone feral a few times. I've found them out in the woods. Now the medicinal part on this are the seeds. So not the leaves, not the flowers, but the seeds and the seeds after they've turned brown and have dried some. Uh, and this is basically uh, women's medicine. So the tisane and the tincture, so the, you know, the water-based or the alcohol-based uh, extraction from the seeds is very good at prolactin regulation. And what's really interesting about it is if you're producing too much prolactin, it kind of tones it down some. If you're not producing enough prolactin, it actually tells your body, hey, go make more prolactin. It's uh, pretty fascinating the way it works. The One of the, the benefits of this is that it's good at soothing uh, symptoms of PMS and also menopause. So the irritability, the hot flashes, uh, the bloating, all those sort of things, um, the prolactin regulation helps affect. So the chase tree is used for that quite a bit. Uh, another thing it does is it increases the likely uh, likelihood of becoming pregnant. Uh, there's something about it that allows the fertilized cell to, to bind uh, increases the likelihood of the fertilized cell to, to bind with the woman's body, the placenta, uh, and just, you know, get its nutrient as opposed to just kind of being miscarried or something like that. Ironically though, uh, if males take a lot of this, it actually reduces the male libido because it's increase, increasing their prolactin uh, level. So I, I, like to think of this tree as proof that God has a sense of humor because it makes the women more likely to become pregnant, but the husband less likely to, you know, want to be involved with that. Um, go figure. So this is used internally, uh, but the, uh, the chase tree, the, the, the berries, the seeds actually have a really good, it's kind of like, I want to say it's like, like a cross between pepper and bottle brush. 
um, but it has kind of a spicy flavor and it was used a lot as a pepper substitute, uh, especially in monasteries and in military barracks. Uh, again, with the thought, if you suppress the libido of the monks and the soldiers, overall, you just have less problems. But again, its main use is in the tea or a tincture uh, for assorted women's hormonal issues, hormonal regulation. Okay, the cottonwood. This is uh, the big trees you find usually growing along wet areas around Texas, but they are used occasionally in landscaping. And there's a lot going on with the cottonwood. First with the bark. Uh, and again, when you're using the bark, especially from the cottonwood, it has really, this is hard to do, really thick bark on its trunk. So you wanna actually get the bark from the uh, newer branches uh, I usually look for branches, you know, between the size of my pinky and the size of a pencil to collect the bark from those because it's fresher, softer, is more likely to contain the medicinal properties. And so a tea or a tisane made from the bark, it is basically another form of aspirin. The salicylin uh, is in the bark and it is an anti-inflammatory. It is a pain reliever. It is a fever reducer. So it is basically aspirin. Uh, the molecule contains when it hits the stomach acid, uh, gets converted into the acetylsalicylic acid that is the prime agent of aspirin. Now, one thing this means though, is you cannot give the cottonwood bark tea to children under the age of 12, 10 or 12. I usually go with 12 because of the Ray's syndrome, the same sort of reason you don't give kids aspirin. It can cause that same sort of thing because it's pretty much the same molecule. So that's the cottonwood bark. Think of it as an aspirin substitute. Now the leaves, uh, again, dried two weeks. Uh, they can then be made into a tea or when they're fresh or dried, they can be made into a poultice. If you use dried leaves for a poultice, you do want to add some warm water to it to make it a mush to put on the skin. But again, it is a pain reliever. It's also antimicrobial. So if you have an infected wound and you're out in the middle of nowhere or the zombies are there and all you have is a cottonwood tree, at least you can try and, you know, kill the bacteria. And it's also been shown to help with sprains and contusions, especially the poultice again. If you have a bad sprained ankle or something, you'd wrap it uh, in a mush of warm cottonwood mashed up leaves and then wrap some cheesecloth or a towel around that and keep it on there. And I see a question. Actually, it's not a question. Oh. Um, the pictures are missing for the slideshow, is what people are saying. People can't see the pictures of the trees. Okay, okay that's, that's weird. weird. Let me just take this. Oops. Because I have the pictures. I don't know why they're not showing up. How annoying. Um, let me do some juggling here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's still gonna work. Uh, how long have the pictures not have none of the pictures shown up? They stopped on Chase Tree. Hmm. All right. Let's, uh, oops. Oh, Chase Tree. So just let's, let's move ahead and see what happens. So the cottonwood, basically aspirin from a tree. Oops. Okay. Can you see the desert willow? So this is one for the Hill Country and West Texas uh, sort of people. I haven't really seen any desert willow in the Houston area, uh, but up in Austin and Bastrop and pretty much from there on west, we have the desert willow. It's not a true willow, but it looks like a willow tree. Um, I'm hoping you can see the pictures. It has these beautiful purplish flowers that are quite large. So do we have pictures back? Pictures back. Yay. Okay. So what do you do with the desert willow? Well, you use the flowers and the flowers can be used fresh or dried. One of the nice things about using flowers as opposed to leaves or bark, excuse me, 
is with the flowers, a lot of the medicinal compounds are actually on the surface of the flower rather than trapped inside the cell wall. As we think a lot of these are you know, attractants for the bees and the butterflies and stuff like that. And the tissue of the flowers themselves is much more delicate. So, um, you know, just the act of heating it or just putting it in vodka will be enough to rupture the cells and get what you want out of it. Now, the desert willow flowers, uh, this is basically antimicrobial again. So it's antifungal. It'll help fight the fungal infections uh, anywhere in the body. Anywhere in the body. Same with the yeast. Uh, Anti-yeast. So it has a uh, recommended for yeast infections for dealing with that sort of thing. A tincture or a tisane. I would think with a yeast infection, you would probably go with the tisane, just the water and flour sort of thing. Um, but that's just me. And then finally, antibacterial. Uh, so it'll kill the microbes both on the surface and inside the body. So again, if you have uh, some sort of uh, bacterial infection, so not viral, but bacterial, the flowers from the desert willow will help with that. Again, as a tisane, so as a tea or as a tincture. And with the flowers, you just have to use vodka. You don't have to use Everclear. You can just put them in fresh in the vodka and you're good to go. Question. All right. So Miss Julie Gracie is wondering, what month do the desert willows flower? Okay, what month do the desert willows flower? They're actually a late winter, springtime flowering uh, plant. The, uh, when I was out in the Big Bend area back in the spring, uh, it was April, and the desert willow were loaded with the flowers. Um, in March, before going out to Big Bend, I was up somewhere. Um, but way up in the, it was like five hours away from Houston uh, and uh, up way in the kind of north central uh, hill country area. And the desert willows that they had in the parking lot of the library where I was talking uh, were also blooming then. So it you know, kind of depends on where you are, but generally they are a late winter springtime sort of flower. Also remember, if you are out in Big Bend National Forest or National Park, it's not really a forest, or the Big Bend uh, Ranch State Park, you're not allowed to collect the flowers there. You have to find private property and convince them you're not crazy and ask if you can collect the flowers from there. Okay, if anyone knows of if it's possible to use desert willow in landscaping and uh, like the East Texas or Gulf Coast area, I'd really be interested in hearing about that because it is a beautiful tree and really pretty, which I guess is beautiful. Okay, oops, next. The loquat. Uh, this is another really good edible plant. The fruit in the late winter is quite tasty. And then the seeds can be made into an amaretto sort of drink. But from a uh, medicinal point of view, it's the leaf that you want. And the leaf of the loquat has been proven to have some anti-cancer uh, properties, some tumor shrinking properties. Uh, so that's really cool. It has a, a, this is one of those things that had a long history in Asian herbal medicine uh, that then Western science took a look at and said, whoa, they're right, which is cool. Um, so that's the biggie, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory. So it reduces swelling and then cough and congestion, your basic head cold, stuffiness, coughing, sneezing, wheezing sort of issues. Uh, the loquat tea made from the leaf or the tincture helps with that. Uh, it also seems to have some antiviral properties, but for some reason it is mainly targeting uh, virus and viral infections of the lungs, which, you know, if you're having coughing congestion, it's a good chance that there's a viral thing. So if you have your basic cold or flu, a low quat tea or tincture made from the leaf will very likely help it. Plus, if you have any cancer going on in your body, it might start doing something against that too. So it's a win-win. Great, great landscaping uh, plant. Now the seeds 
are kind of interesting. They have these big seeds inside the fruit. And again, a tincture or a tisane uh, made from it uh, that's anti-inflammatory. So if you have swelling of some sort, it will help with that. What's really interesting though is the seeds also have some compounds that uh, a number of studies have shown help protect healthy cells from the damage done by chemotherapy. Uh, always a useful thing. Basically, chemotherapy, its goal is to kill the cancer cells before it kills the healthy cells. So anything you can do to give the healthy cells a kind of a hand up and protection, that's going to be good. So it, it protects the healthy cells, but does not protect the, the cancerous cells. A uh, tisane from it again, also helps uh, reduce allergic dermat uh, dermatitis. So if you have uh, skin irritation, so if you work with chemicals or fiberglass or something there at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're getting the red, you know, itchy skin, uh, patchy skin, uh, a wash with the uh, loquat seed to saying will help soothe that and uh, reduce it. And then interestingly enough, the tisane, there's something about it that uh, helps to control blood sugar in the, in the blood. And so it's actually used to treat both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, I was a little surprised that it, it actually, there's a, quite a bit of research and proof that it helps with both type 1 and type 2 because the type 1 is very different from type 2. Uh, basically, uh, I'm hoping I don't get this backwards, but the type 2 is where you don't have insulin and your blood sugar spikes up and you kind of go into a sugar coma as opposed to type 1 diabetes, diabetes is where uh, your body can't use the sugar and so you just kind of go into a no energy coma. But there's a number of research projects that have shown a uh, extracts from the loquat seed help with both type 1 and type 2. So again, good for when the zombies come. All right, magnolia. Nothing quite smells like a magnolia tree in the spring when it's blooming. Um, you'd almost just looking at it think there's got to be something good about it, and there is besides just the smell. So the seeds and the leaf both have medicinal properties. Um, so with the magnolia, uh, magnolia seeds, they're the bright red things, uh, a tincture. So mash them up, put them in the, uh, in the case of the seeds, I'm going to use them fresh right off the tree rather than dry them. One thing with seeds, uh, like the magnolia, when they dry, they kind of shrivel up and it just makes it harder to extract stuff out. So I will mash up the magnolia seeds fresh and then put them in the Everclear to increase the rupturing of the fresh cells. But a tincture has been found to be uh, have anti-tumor properties, so it, it shrinks uh, tumors. Awesome. Anti-inflammatory, so it, it helps again with swellings and other inflamed tissues, not just like sprains and so forth, but throughout the body. Antibacterial, pretty good. Anti-seizure. They've done a number of uh, tests and found that it actually helps with different seizure, seizures, including epileptic seizures. Now, if you're in the throes of a grand mall, do not try to give them uh, the magnolia tisane or sorry, the magnolia tincture. Uh, but as kind of a preventative sort of thing, there's some proof that it actually has some anti-seizure properties. And then finally, it also is a sedative. Uh, there's some belief that the anti-seizure and the sedative uh, effects are basically caused by the same compounds, um, but pretty useful. Uh, the tincture of the magnolia seeds, and you want to get them when they're that bright red color, like hopefully you can see in the picture there. Now, the leaves of the magnolia are very strongly anti-cancer. Again, there's a, quite a bit of research uh, again, supporting the tincture and the tisane as a uh, cancer preventative and a cancer reducer. That being said, if you have cancer, please do not forego the chemotherapy. Use this in addition if you are going to use it at all. Um, 
So the magnolia leaf, uh, tisane or a tincture, anti-cancer. It's also antibacterial, but mainly for the bacterial that are found in the mouth. So particularly the ones that cause gingivitis, cavities, uh, basically mouth issues. There's something about magnolia leaf tea and tincture that helps that. If I were using the magnolia specifically for gingivitis or anti-cavity, in that case, I would not use a tincture. I would use a tisane and then basically gargle and swish it around in my mouth for a while uh, just to so the chemicals can get there against the bacteria. With a tincture, you're you know, taking a couple of dropperfuls and immediately swallowing it. So they're not going to be in contact with the bacteria. Does that make sense? Makes sense. All right. Uh, any questions? All right. So do the loquat leaves have to be dried before making tea? I recommend drying the leaves if you're making a tea or the tisane. Again, because the dried leaves, they will have holes through the cell walls so the medicinal compounds can actually get out. If you just use the fresh green leaves, you have to chop them up, you have to blend them up, you know, almost smoothie them. And it's actually not going to taste very good because there's going to be a lot of chlorophyll uh, in the, the tea also from the green leaves. Is one of the things that drying does is it breaks down a lot of the chlorophyll and plus chlorophyll is a big molecule it has a hard time getting out through excuse me the small holes made by the uh, the enzyme breaking the cell wall so yes dry it first you'll get much better results from it all right we got another one? Oh, sure so dried leaves or crushed fresh ones for magnolia okay Again, dried leaves. When possible, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend using the dried leaves just because you've allowed it to naturally break the cell wall down again. Um, like I said, if you crush up the green leaves, the, the flavor is going to be rather unpleasant. If you've ever had ginseng tea, that's kind of what the magnolia leaf and the loquat leaf both kind of taste. They have kind of a ginsengy, earthy sort of flavor when dried fresh it's much more bitter and unpleasant because you know i had a try okay whoops oh oh wow that's already 851 um and we're you know only to the m's uh, i'm going to do something here quick whoops Okay, another word from our sponsor, the Uncommon Bees. Uh, like I said, they're the ones that supply me with all my honey. But one of the things recently that they've started is the CBD oil-infused honey. So uh, for those of you who are interested in the cannabinoid uh, products infused honey, they have theirs uh, there and ready to go. It... Uh, from what uh, I've never tried it, it's not something I've really had a chance to, so I can't say much. But the research, especially uh, in the last year, there's some really, really amazing things coming out with the CBD oil, the, the you know, basically marijuana oil. Um, and I will say that they have the all the licenses and so forth to do this. The CBD is a secondary product from the marijuana. It's not a primary product. And so it is unregulated. Um, that being said, they get theirs from a very reliable source that's chemically extracted and measured. And so they know exactly how much is in their honey. So if you're looking for a good source of the CBD oils uh, in honey, this is probably the best one in Houston. Um, you can also order it online from them too. Okay, so we only made it to Mimosa. We have a number of trees left. I guess this is going to be a multi-week medicinal plant presentation. That's okay, because, you know, lots to say, lots to do. Um, ooh, we have a question. Are these PowerPoint presentations available for download anywhere? No, not yet. <laughs> um, you're going to have to reload the videos and look at them and take your notes. Uh, the main reason for not putting them out there uh, is just so I can control 
uh, where they end up and who's seen them and things like that and kind of copyright issues and plus I am working on a medicinal plant book so at this time the uh, the PowerPoint presentations are not available uh, one thing though if you do attend my medicinal plant classes let me see this here um, you get a pamphlet with the information that has the you know it's actually uh, uh, the pamphlet is based on the location of the class so like uh, last week whoops last week I was up in the hill country doing a medicinal workshop and so they got the you know hill country book uh, this Saturday, I'll be teaching a medicinal class. It's a rescheduled class. There are no openings, uh, but here in Houston, and so they get the plants of the East Coast and Gulf, um, or sorry, the East Texas and Gulf uh, Coast region. And just to show the inside, it doesn't have pictures of the plants right now. It just has the name of the plant and then the part of the plant and how you use different parts and, you know, just use it as a, to say, in a concoction, uh, uh, decoction the you know the different properties or sorry the different concoctions of the plants okay but yeah as far as the powerpoints i'm still trying to figure out how to do it i've looked at um setting up uh there's a couple of websites that allow you to sell the powerpoint um so i'm looking at that but or well sell it as a pdf if you will um but uh i mean let's I put a lot of work into these things and I'm trying to figure out some way to get a, a slightly better return on investment other than, you know, wine and honey, which brings me up to another thing because we have just a few minutes left. If you are looking to sponsor Meriwether's World, get a hold of me. Uh, email Meriwether at foragingtexas.com or through Facebook or I have multiple ways you can get a hold of me but i'm quickly running out of the sponsors i've set up i mean we've got this is the sixth show already um next week it will be vista brewing will be the sponsor but after that i'm looking for some people so talk to me let's talk uh maybe you have something that uh, will work for the viewers and me and everyone um camping gear is good by the way Okay, so do we have any other questions? And I'm sure there are lots. So. Oh, we have a plethora. <laughs> All right, so should you use dried leaves or crushed fresh ones in general? Again, in general, dried leaves are going to be better. Um, partially because, again, you can get the, the good stuff out more easily um, and you'll be straining out the chlorophyll. The chlorophyll is a very bitter molecule. Some of the chlorophyll is broken down and powers the enzymes that's doing the breaking down of the cell wall. Um, but if you just take a green leaf and crush it, it's not going to taste as good. And a number of these already taste a little on the bitter side. So anything you can do to improve the flavor is usually worth doing, especially if you're uh, treating kids and picky eaters and people that you know don't want to cure the cancer because it tastes bad, which... Um, maybe there's someone like that out there. I don't know. Okay. Uh, basically, time for maybe one more question. All right. Are there any books with these trees and instructions listed? Oh, yeah. Okay. We're going to probably go a little long. So books that I recommend. And you can get these from the Amazon Shop uh, Foraging Texas website. Um, so let's talk quick about books. Uh, so one of my favorites is the Herbal Vlad Mecum by uh, Gasmin's uh, Skandari. Uh, and what this is, is it lists the plant and then the types of uh, compounds, the chemistry of the plant and the properties of these chemicals and then how to use it, uh, you know, what form do you access the medicinal compounds in. So that one's really good. There's also the Herbal Medicine of the American Southwest by Charles W. Kane. And again, uh, this is based on the scientific research that he found uh, doing years of, of going through the scientific papers, looking and seeing just, you know, what has been proven and what hasn't been proven. So again, it talks about the chemistry of the plant and then how to actually turn 
that chemistry or those chemicals into medicine. And then he also has an older book that's just called Herbal Medicine. There's some overlap between uh, this book by Charles W. Kane and the one specifically about the Southwest plants. But again, both talk about the chemistry and how to use it. And then, of course, there's Rosemary Gladstar's Medicinal Herbs. Uh, this is, again, more the kitchen herb type stuff. And it doesn't so much go into the chemistry, but after going through her book and, and looking at the plants and how they're used, it, it ties up a lot uh, with the research that has actually been proven for the use of these. Uh, one side note, this is also a very pretty book. It makes a good gift. So if you get got, like, uh, I don't know, a birthday or Christmas or something like that coming up, uh, give this to the people in your life and, again, protect them from the zombies. Uh, another one I like is Myco Medicinals. This is about the medicinal mushrooms by Paul Stamets, probably the number one mushroom researcher out there. And again, it's all the scientifically proven medicinal properties of a dozen different mushrooms. So very, very useful. And then last but not least is the Modern Herbal Dispensatory. Uh, and this again is like it says a medicine making guide and it uses both wild and domesticated plants uh, again looking at the science and how to convert them into medicines one of the nice thing about this book is he goes a lot into combinations of plants that work well together um, i usually to keep things simple i may do one or two plants uh, but his combinations can go up to like five plants that work really well together but again, all these books are available through the Amazon.com slash shop slash Foraging Texas uh, Amazon store. And if you buy the books from there, I get about 6% of the purchase price. So if the book's 10 bucks, you know, I get 60 cents. But it adds up over the years. All right, we are one minute past the stopping time. Um, if you have questions, continue to post them in the, 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 the Facebook page here, and I will answer them, uh, a lot of them probably tonight and some tomorrow. Uh, but also one last thing, remember, if you want to attend a class in person, there are uh, ones coming up that still have slots this Saturday in spring. The host is Spear Survival. They were our sponsor a couple of uh, weeks or yeah, a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, the following weekend, the October 27th, it will be up at Deer Lake Spa up in Montgomery, which uh, is a pretty fancy place. Okay, again, another hour plus has gone by. I've been stalking, talking steady. Uh, no time for words of wisdom. So at this point, I will just say adieu until actually next week. Uh, I'm thinking it might be creepy stories rather than medicinal plants, but you'll just have to tune in and see. All right. Good night, everyone.